that as yeah. a young fellow he was a butcher in Germany. That's right, he was a professional butcher, a yeah. small goodsman. Yes, yeah. yeah, and he told me the yeah. reason why they had to wear the, the leather over their shoulder with the pork, because there was a little wog, he said, in it, got oh. into the brain. I remember Go him telling on. me that. He Good said, that's luck. the reason we wear that. Go on. But uh, as a working mate, underground, what oh, did you like? Oh, extra good, extra good, yes. Do you, uh, did you have any luck with him? Oh, n we never got that much. We nice, pleasant working conditions, and we got a bit of opal at the three mile, but not any quantity much, Lenny. No. Another gentleman in those days would have been here would have been Georgie Lowe. Yes, I remember him well. He was a German too. He came out just before the war, he told me, in a sailing ship. And he said he could see, they could see there was a war coming over there in Europe and he thought, oh, I'll get away. And he said he was just as well because he had three brothers and the three of them were killed in the war. And he stopped the rest of his life about here, I think. I can, re I can remember him when I first come here to live. He was a man in his 80s then. That's right. And uh, he was a very quiet gentleman who lived yeah. up on the Nobby. That's right, yeah. Very quiet. He All I ever seen was one beautiful stone he had those days. Yeah. He wanted 100 pounds of carrot, which was like us asking $10,000 a yeah, carrot today. Yeah, that's right. But it was right. a beautiful stone. That's right. He Did you ever work with the gentleman? No, not exactly, Lenny. No, I never worked with him, but I knew him pretty well, but... Never worked with him. He worked a lot about hard knobby there, and he got some good stones there in that hard ground hammer and gadding it out. You know, it was very hard and dusty, and he used to gad it out like. That's where his camp was, and that's where he finished. Yeah, his up life. on hard yeah. knobby. Yeah, I'm that's right, Lenny. What yeah. about Yorkie? Was he here when you were? Yes, there? I remember Yorkie very well. He was a Yorkie, <laughs> a Yorkshireman. He came here, he was a noodler, and uh, he battled it all over the world, over the United States, he told me, and over most of, a lot of America, and that before he came here, and he settled down to Three Mile, he could never hardly ever find his way home, he used to get lost going to the Three Mile. He had no sense of direction much, but that's how he got lost in the wet years, he got away bit from his camp and he wandered away and they found him dead a couple of years after. Yes. Do you remember what year he passed away? Uh, about 1950, about 1950, Lenny. About 1950, yes, yeah. Somewhere I about I heard many that. stories about Yorkie. Yeah. And uh, one of them was related to Yorkie and Larry Reynolds. Did you oh, ever hear it? Yes, about I About the think opal I down the shaft? Yeah, Tell so. it, please. Better than me <laughs> telling it. Oh, oh, and they say that I think they it's very were, true. was pecking round the top of the hill and Yorkie spotted a coloured stone down a mole out an open mouth shaft and he said, hold me leg, Larry, and then let me down and I'll get it. And when he got it, he said, you get it? He said, yes. He said, who owns it, you or me? He said, I suppose you do, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> That's Talking a about bu Larry Reynolds, can you ever remember a tougher man on this field <laughs> no, than Larry Reynolds? Pretty tough, yeah. Uh, tell us yeah. your first encounters with Larry Reynolds. Oh, well, he was well known about here. I think people used to give him a bit of a miss, I think. <laughs> yes, if they could. <laughs> did you ever sell him an opal? Yes, I think I did. Yes, yes, Lenny, I've sold him a bit in days gone by, yes. Yeah. He went to, to Wormber, I think he'd be passed away now. Yeah. Have to be, yes. He got himself into a lot of trouble here yeah. before he left. Yeah, he did, yeah. And uh, I'd, love to yeah. Be able, I'd love to be you interviewing me because I know the story in detail. Yes, but I, I can't know. tell it from this end of the camera. No, I know, no, no. Because no. <coughs> I was involved in oh, it was very indirectly. Very greedy man. I got trapped in it, and so did my brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a very greedy man. Yeah. My brother yeah. called him the walking devil, the devil That's himself. Right. I think he was right. He shot his own son, George, you know. No, I didn't know. Didn't that. you know George? He was a nice bloke. You'd never think he was like Larry. He used to come here every year. And he came one day, and he used to stop at Pluto's up here, him yeah. and his wife. 
And uh, he said, he said, oh, Larry shot me. I said, how? Oh. He said he was stopping down our place and he was sitting in the dining room and I walked in one day and he up with a pea rifle and shot me through just above the heart. And he said, six months after it cut the strings of George's heart and he died. Six months after from it. I never heard about yeah, that. Yeah, that happened. But I had heard a story about him and a tin of jam and a shearing and shed in Queensland. Right. Is that true? Cunnamulla, I think so. Tell yes. us the story, Wilson. Oh, well, at the dining table in this big shearing shed there, they had an argument, him and someone else, and the bloke said something to him, and he picked up a jam tin and th tin of jam and threw it and hit this bloke in the head and killed him. He was a yeah. tough man. Yes, I, I think I so. knew him for many years, you knew that's him for many years. That's right. I don't yeah. think a tougher man walked the streets no, of Lightning Ridge. No, I, I think so. I think you're right, mate. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> yes, I think so, Lynn. Who was some of the other old-timers before we get on to the more Well, days? Tom Leonard and Mick Cantrell. You live in Tom Leonard's house. That's right. That's Tom's house here. Tell yes. us about Tom. Yes. Tell us about Tom. Tom was read about here. He worked on Angledell Station for years and he came here in the rush days and he spent most of his time about Lightning Ridge here from the rush days, 1910 on, till he died. He died about 1954 or so. What did he look like? Can you describe the man to us? Oh, he was a tall, thin sort of Scotchman, yeah. Scotchman, wasn't All he? very tough man, yeah, they had Scotch breed. All the cutlers at Colorenda Briary's nephews, the elder cutlers, they were all Scotch. These, their mother and Tom were brother and sisters, Lenny. Yeah. Did he ever make any decent opal pies? Oh, yeah, he got nice bits of opal. He worked right up till he died. He was 82 or 3 when he died, and he was still working, doing a bit of mining, you know. And you knew Cantrell, too? Yeah, old Mick, yes. He was the bloke that found Cantrell's field. And he he worked here, and he, he was one of the first six men that were here when the fields were first started. And then he drew a block out at the Bollin and he was there for 20 years. And when his wife died, he sold out and came back here to live till he died here. He died here. Yeah, that's right. Lynn. What did Mick actually look like? Mick Cantrell. Oh, he was a tall, old, thin fella. Very tough. One of the old, tough men, you know. Yes, he what was. What about Durham Bandy Bill? Had an, uh, yes, he came here then. He came here about 1950 or so. Yes, he did. George Cox brought him here to sink a, a sub-artesian bore, and he stopped here mining then for a few years till he passed away, Lenny. Yeah. He was a nice old gentleman. I knew him oh, very well. Oh, yes, of course he was. But I, there was one man I knew here for many years, he was a likeable bloke, but I don't think he could handle the truth too good, and that was Alec Hetherington. Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, that's right, Lenny. I remember him too. Yes, I do. Yes, old Alec. I think he's over at Parks now. I think he's at Parks now. Yeah. But you wasn't quite sure whether he's telling you the truth or no, pulling you the legs. That's a bit that way, yes, I think But so. do you know anything about the patch of Oakley he got up on Nobby? Well, I know we pulled the claim to get the old dirt and we pulled for a solid week and washed the dirt and we only got five pounds. We never got any good dirt. <laughs> Even the English boys cleaned it up. Yeah, well, we never done any good out of it. We didn't know how much opal he got. He always reckoned he got none, but we knew he got some good opal. Well, I'll tell you something yeah. now. You knew I brought opal for many, many years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, it was shown to me for sale, and it was shown to David Kaplan for sale. I can assure you, and I can assure those in the, in, in the future who looks at this tape, that he got a huge amount of opal. That'd be right, yeah. I've seen with my own eyes. That'd be dead right. Beautiful yeah. red on the black. Yeah, that But I tell you what, he'd be better cutting diamonds than he would opal because yeah. he used to cut his own and he yeah, just about ruined. faceted it. That's right, that'd be so Terrible. Yeah.
Oh, yeah. push bike. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, that'd be right, Lenny, yeah. But he didn't have the main claim. Mick Monero had the main claim. Yes, on that second lot of Nobby, yes, he did. Yeah. Uh, I tell you, I, I dug a stone there with Tom Leonard working there in Bruce's and, and Brown's claim. It was a stone right on the roof. I ran the pick through some ashy stuff and I got it. And it was a thick, solid red stone. I've got the photo of it in there, I'll show you later. The uh, butterfly wings are the name of it. It's a renowned stone today, Lenny. Uh, we sold it to poor old Jack Francis for a big round stone, solid like that, thick colour, for 64 pound, I think old Tom sold it. And Mrs Francis told me they had it cut in Sydney and it was a pair of butterfly wings and it was priceless, and I think she said Jack got 850 pounds for it. That's then. what you call making a profit. Yes, that's right. Today, yeah. as we both know today, that stone would be absolutely priceless. I, I'll show you the photo of it in a minute, mate. That, i got the folder in there that, with it on. That'll be very, very interesting. Yes. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, we'll try and stay with some of the old pensioners that were still here at the time. Bobby Bishop was here when I came here. Yeah, that's right, He yeah. told me he yeah. came here in 1903. Yeah, yes, well that's true as a boy. Uh, his father, his father had that gun claim on the flat at the Three Mile, and I tell you what George Cowan told me, he said the best stone he ever saw here, he was recognised as one of the best opal valuers and buyers in, uh, in Australia for years, when he, this is years back, and he told me the best stone he ever seen, he bought off Bob Bishop and Jack Austin for 25 pounds. And I tell you where it come from. You know where Greg McDonald lives? You know, they're near the Canadians. Yes, yes, yes. Just, just that side of Greg McDonald, right under the road in Pines Old Claim. Anyhow, I asked Bob Bishop, uh, I'll tell you the story because George Cowan said he, the Depression was on and there was five or six lots of men working there at the time. And he rode along on the bike doing a bit of buying and he said, anyone got any? And they said, oh, these blokes have got a bit of a stone. It's pretty sun flashy, everything, they thought. So he said, I wasn't going to wait. But then I waited till they come up for a cup of tea. And he said, as soon as I seen it, I, I said, how much? And they said, we want 25 pounds. Times were very hard at the time. And he said, I put my hand straight in my pocket and got the money. And when I got along the road, I flipped the shell off it. It had a big loose shell of matrix and it cut the 42 carat most beautiful stone ever seen, he said. And he said there wasn't a thing in the way of selling opal and Hardy Brothers in Sydney sent it to uh, that big firm Christie's in London and sold it for 400 pounds for him. And well, he said, that was the best opal I've ever seen in my life. And that came from in a lot of sunflash knobbies, like in Pine's old claim. Jack, uh, Bob Bishop told me him and Jack Austin were working together. Incidentally, Jack Austin rode away in the push bike. He was never seen again. They reckon that Moss murdered him at Dubbo. You know, that like that killed the 13 bagman. No, I don't know that story. Tell us a yeah, bit about it. Yeah, he was hung at Bathurst Jail, uh -huh. Len Moss, and uh, he used to kill these poor fellas for their swags. He, he was a big, like a gorilla he was, Moss, like, and he used to kill them when they'd go to sleep with axe and burn their bodies. And, and Austin was one? Jack Austin was never seen again. No, the old men here thought, well, he, Moss got him somewhere, you know. He Austin. was never heard of I again. I hear Austin had a good claim at one that stage was, up, up on the cleared line. That was old Bob Austin. Oh. He was an Englishman. Yes, we pulled his claim, Lenny. He, I could tell you a lot about him too. He'd been a gold miner. He'd been to the Klondike. 
and he'd been to Johannesburg in South Africa gold mining and he told me he came here and he was going out to Krakow. There was a gold strike out in Queensland. And he pulled up up there on the Walgett Road and he had a horse and sulk and he lockstrapped the horse and walked over and he picked a stone up on Ewing Brothers' claim. Ewing Brothers later had them little wagons with the Clydesdale horses that used to cart their bear about Sydney to the hotels and their sons still own the trucks that do it. They had a good claim there on the cleared line and he said he picked this 40 pound stone up, he sold it down here for it. So he decided to stay and he went over in the paddock and pitched his camp and sunk a 50 foot shaft and drove in 70 foot and he said the money he had, he only had 13 pounds and this stone. And by then the money was just about gone and he was going to go on the next morning. So he went back that night to have the last try and get the tools and ready to leave in the morning. And he hit the steel band up the roof and it was full of stones. So that big 1914-18 war was on in Germany, in, in, with Germany, and he, he took out some of the steel band and he sold 1,200 pounds worth and he enlisted in the war and he, he got George Cox, he was the sergeant there, to look after his claim for him for all those years he was away. And when he came back, he got Billy and Jack Francis to sink another hole and he paid them to take the toe out and he got a great big patch of opal all in the steel band and he used to go overseas with it and he lived it up and anyhow as he took the claim out he took the pillars out and he fell the claim on the little bit of dirt he fleed all his dirt on a wheat bag and uh, Anyhow, we pulled the claim after and we got a, a magnificent stone. The Canadians might tell you about it. I remember oh, both you telling me about it once. You oh, may not recall it. You said he must have missed it when he dragged a bit of dirt around the corner and fell yeah. off his bag. You remember yeah, you that's me that. right. Yeah, years or so yeah it was a beautiful 19 carat black pattern stone. Yeah, I never the seen a stone. The most perfect stone. Fred Giles bought it and took yeah. it to Sydney yeah, somewhere. I've never seen the Sherman's stuff. bought it, I heard, in Sydney. Where it went to, I don't know, but oh, it was a truly magnificent. Who was it that helped you pull that shaft? Uh, Kevin Mearns. He was a bloke that came here. Do you remember? Was Arthur Blackwell him? involved there? Yeah, Arthur Blackwell was in a sort of a way. He had that great big thorny cough dry paddler. Yeah. And Kevin Mearns borrowed it and he... And, and the rain when we pulled a heap of dirt and he's trying to paddle this wet dirt and he broke the crankshaft of the big paddler. Do you remember that? <laughs> it <laughs> ruined the paddler, a beautiful motor yeah. it was. Yeah, trying to turn it with the mud in the... Yeah. It wouldn't paddle, you know. And, uh, well, that was, a good, that was a good claim, there's no two ways yes, about it. You don't it, know anything about the Ewing brothers. Yes, well, they got some stones there. They had a big court case over it. Old Bob went seven feet over into their boundary and Ewing Brothers sued him and they got 400 pound a foot or something, 700 pound, I think, compensation off him, you know. But uh, Then they went to Sydney and they bought them wagons with the, you know, the beautiful Clydesdale horses and the brass harness on them that used to bring the beer around the hotels. Then as time went on they got lorries, you know. And that's how they started their business from the Opal here. That's right. The yeah. Opal here. Yeah, ah, that's right. That's yeah. Very, very interesting. Yeah. What other good claims was up there on that field? There's oh. many more I don't think. Oh yes, old Billy at the not many on the cleared line, mate, no. Uh, no, uh, there wasn't many there. Up on the phone line there was a few, Lenny. Uh, Bill Stedman had a good one. Uh, Did you ever see any other Oh, and those Germans that uh, they were interned. They had a beautiful claim under the road. They had the opal and 
When they went away and were interned, that was never found again here. They planted it somewhere up on the hill there, and it was never found again. Mm. Yeah. We hear those stories on every opal field, don't we? Yeah, but that's some right. of them are true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They're yeah. fables, yeah. yeah. They're like all gold fields and that have got <laughs> stories, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, that, that, that's very, very interesting. Who was the other old pensioners? Of course, there was Boodle. Everybody knew Boodle. Yeah, Boodle. everyone knew Fred Boodle, yeah. What was your impression of him when you first oh, met him? Oh, he was all right, yeah. Yeah, old Foley and Billy Kite. And <laughs> yes, I think we all knew well, Let's them. stay with Freddie Bodell for a little while. Yeah. Um, did you ever work with him? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, whereabouts? Down on that three mile hard flat. Did he ever work anywhere else besides there? No, yeah, when he came here, him and four other blokes got a tremendous patch of opal at New Chum. Mm -hmm. Where New Chum run back into the deeper ground they were reputed to get three wheat bags of black stones, like potatoes, but they only got 1,100 pounds or something yeah. for them in them days. Your figures yeah. are pretty close, because I'll tell you why. Yeah. Boodle told me the same thing, and this is my old diary, 25 odd years ago, Yeah. and the figures you're quoted are very, very close to the, the yeah. figures that Boodle actually told me. Yeah. So your, your yeah. memory's good, Bert. Oh, I don't know. So they're very close to those figures. Yeah, somewhere about that. He actually told me that they, the patch was about eight foot wide and they were about a foot thick and they were in it mm. like, like, yeah. uh, like walnuts, like yeah. potatoes. Yeah. And I think the story he said to me, if I was to read my diary now, was that they could throw a blanket over their section, but the biggest mm. section was in the next claim. Oh. It went for 20 yeah. foot long, eight yeah. foot wide and a foot thick. Go on. Good That's Lord. how he described it. Yes, I know. So, when you added up, Bert, yeah. even when I came here and when you came here, it was only the red oval we could sell, the green yeah, oval. Yeah, that's true. You, you gave could. the green oval to your friend. Just about, yes. Yeah, you friend. got very little yeah. for it. That's right. Called it Irishman's opal back in Freddie Bodell's day. That's right. Very hard yeah. to sell. Very now, hard to sell. They got that much money for redstones, uh, which would constitute less than 1% of everything that was in the patch. What That's would you get for it today? Oh, right? yeah. Millions oh, and millions yeah. and millions. If you could get a patch like Scotch or some of them now. Eh? Mate, oh, Lord, yes. You'd test the opal buyers out? Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, if you could, yeah. <laughs> My word, Lee. We certainly would. I was just trying to think of one or two of the other old time was here when I came here. Yeah, that's I know right. Bobby Bishop was here. He told me he'd come here in 1903 with his father and they were in the first rush at Sims Hill. That's right, yes. Well, they were reputed to get three three hide buckets of opal there. Did you ever hear that story? No, I don't know all the details. Yes, well, they said the, they stopped down two days or something and nights digging this out and when the, someone come back and said, how are you going? They said, pull up, pull up the dirt. And they pulled the dirt, a few buckets, and he said, now pull the opal, three buckets of opal. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> like the sheep yard today. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it sounds yeah. like the sheep yard today. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Come on, we'll come on a little bit more, uh, uh, on a little further. Can you remember the boys when they found the uh, the dry rush? Didn't a couple of boys find the dry rush about 1960 somewhere, a good claim there? No, no, it was got earlier than that, yeah. Lenny, but like this murder and suicide you mean, do you, over? Well, a lot of things happened, yes. Yeah, well, that was in 1941 that happened, Lenny. Well, I'm a long way out in the information. Well, the story, yes. well, mate. Uh, they, uh, Daffy Reynolds sunk the hull on his own and it was a very hard vertical hull and he was sick of it by the time he bought him, never seen nothing, pulled the logs off, Dick Huggett was down at the phone line and he walked up and found some traces or something. Him and his, uh, just through the fence there, Dupain, and he was over in the billiard saloon, lived there. They worked it and they got a tremendous patch of opal and opal the war was on then and you couldn't sell opal there was no sale for it and they decided to solder the tin up a bit one of them old square biscuit tins and 
take it down to the three mile and bury it on the second level up a drive and stow the drive up. Anyhow, they went to Sydney and had a fight down there in Hyde Park and they started to hate one another. And Dufane come home and whether he sold some of the opal or something, a week after Dick Huggett came home from Sydney and he said, we better have a look at the opal. They unstowed the drive and there was no tin there. It was gone. And Japan said, well, you've got to have it. You've got a week to find it. And he said, no, you've got to have it. So the week was up. He walked over and shot him, walked in here in this old house here and shot himself then. And we don't know. We, we don't can know who guess. Got the we can guess who got it, but you better not say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know what you mean. <laughs> it's a pity that the truth can't always be told for history. Isn't yes. It? Well, well, possibly, possibly it's better not to say, maybe. Yeah. You know, because some of their, some of their relations are about, about and there, yeah. that, and you better not to say that. In but a hundred, hundred someone, years time all the yeah. relations will be dead and everybody oh, will be dead and yeah. everybody would love to know yeah. the fine details, wouldn't they? I suppose so, yeah, they that's would. true. That, yeah. That's so true. They yeah, would. that's right, yeah. Well, you, you must be able to remember very clearly when the boys got the opal at Nobby's up there. Um, the Bruce boys. Bruce boys yes, I can, Lenny. Can you, uh, can you yeah. tell me some details about that at all? Yes, well, there was a hole there. Uh, Mick Wolf, and he went away to the war and they were killed at the war, him and the two that were working down there near where uh, Don Gregory is there. Brian Collins got some opal out of the Alata. They went away and they were both killed at Al El Alamein with the one bomb. It killed and hit them two men and killed them. They were Englishmen. Uh, uh, Mick Wolf was one and uh, uh, shoot or some name like that. Anyhow, that sunk a hole there and on a bit of trace and cocky Bruce drunk fell over the fence one day there and found a stone. Old Frank Brown gave him 20, 12 pounds for it, I think. And of course he pegged it out and then George and Sid Graham, we were cheering all the time and didn't have much time and Sid and George Graham pulled the hole, didn't do much. Then John Molyneux went into it when he went down in the hotel here, him and Neil, and they got straight onto the opal like and then Bruce has pegged below him and they got a patch of opal there and Phil Melville and since there's been a good pocket got in Phil's old claim and uh, yeah, that's when that happened. Did Lenny. you ever hear how much opal the Bruce boys got in value? No, I couldn't tell you, Lenny. I had just come here to live at Lightning Ridge when it yeah. happened, and the, and, the, and the general consensus was about thirty-three thousand pounds Go at on. the time. Yeah, I know, could have been too. And of course, we all know, and they won't even deny it themselves. If they're no. sitting here, they would be happy to tell us. Yeah. That they they gave it all to the publicans. Oh, I think they he got most of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, they yeah. they even flew up ice in aeroplanes so they could cool off certain. <laughs> yeah. But they, they won't deny it. No, that'd be right. That won't I, deny I think it. that'd be right. Yeah. yeah. But it was a yeah. rich it was a rich little patch. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. I can tell you this, Bert. Of all the dumps that I ever spent in my 25 years at Lightning Ridge, no yeah. dumps held as much pretty colour as those did. No. So they they no. must have been a pr pretty savage with the snips. Yeah, very likely. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. savage with the snips. Yes, they, I think so. They got a stone up there which was had a name. Uh, what was the name of that stone? The Lightning uh, Ridge. Stone. John Molyneux got one he named. Uh, I really don't know what he called it, Lynn. There, there oh, Pride of Lightning Ridge or something, was it? That's right, the Pride of Lightning yeah, Ridge. Didn't I think Harold Hodges buy that stone I off I think he could have, yeah. The Pride yeah. of Lightning Ridge? Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. I have an idea that Harold brought that yeah, stone I think so. from them. And yeah. uh, I can't recall all the details, but it was around about 90 pounds of carrot. He paid a lot of money. Yeah, that should be right, yeah. Yeah. What other patches in those days can you remember? Oh, well, 
I can remember stories the old men told me more than what we got. We got a couple of bits of patches, but not big ones like Scott's or Dunstan's or any of them, you know. Uh, I mean, uh, ours was only small patches, but I'd like to have them now, but we didn't get that much out of them in them days, you know, but we, like we, we got Scott's, a bit of opal, but you didn't get much money, you mean. No, but I could tell you the story about Scott's claim, perhaps it was recognised as about the best claim ever got here in the olden days, anyhow. Uh, uh, old son Bruce and Jackie Maine and his partner sunk it down to the second level and they got a nice patch of opal. They sold it in the rough for 400 and odd pound. It just covered the two sheets of a Sydney Morning Herald of beautiful black stones, out and out gemstones. And they run into a mud wall and never bothered. They thought, oh, that's the end of it left it and the other side of that mud wall was the great big patch of Scots and Callens and anyhow they got it out and they split the parcel in two it was a whopping great parcel and uh, old Jack Scott took it to England and uh, that uh, that was many years later wasn't it yeah this was about about 1917 or something when he took it to England yeah it was about 15 or 17 when it was got and uh, he took it over in Wollaston seen it in England and he said where's the rest of the parcel and he said my partner's got it and he left caught the boat straight out and he had to try till he got the other half of the parcel it was so beautiful and so good and uh, Anyhow, after years went by, Jack Scott sort of stopped over there for a couple of years and he got rid of his money, hobnobbing about in England and America. And uh, he, old Billy Stedman's claim at Bald Hill, Phil Brady, Silent Jimmy and Phil Brady dug a magnificent 500 carat black stone out of a pillar. And they tell the story, Phil Brady was a little Irishman, old silent Jimmy used to talk and they asked him how he got it. Well he said, we used to go down and silent never talk and of a night he'd say, do you see anything? Old Phil would say to him, he'd say, what do you think I'd see? So anyhow he said, I was that disgusted and threw the pick at the pillar and out rolled this big stone, he said. <laughs> and uh, 500 carats of beautiful big black stone. Anyhow, they were talking 500 pounds. No, Jack Scott came back that Sunday and walked down to the cricket ground. There was a cricket match on a boil knot, January day. And the old fella said, Jack, have a look at this. You've had a lot of good opal. See what do you reckon it's worth? And he said, well, it's a nice stone, but he said, we had 80 better stones than that one. Man, man. Yes. Man, <laughs> and we man. sold them for 80 pound each, he said. Man, oh, Yes, man. you imagine them now, them oh. sort of stones, yeah. Oh, yeah, we, yeah. We just can't comprehend it, can we? No, I know. You need That's very little right. opal today to make a huge amount of money. That's right, it's yeah. Bert, we were in the wrong generation. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah. that's true. We've got the experience. But Anyhow, we've had the opal, but we're in the days. Well, we're well, we just got to be contented with life. That's what it. about the old Dunstan stone? It's got. Yes, a well, it's a little story too. Him and old Happy Jack were over at Angledool here. He was his partner, and anyhow. There was opal on five levels, and it was only about 14 foot deep down to the bottom level. And they got these two great big stones like emu eggs. And anyhow, old Happy Jack slapped the end off one. It's called the Light of the World today, and it's in the Rockefeller Museum in New York. Well, as far as we know, it was there not long ago. And uh, uh, he went out drink. Dunstan was a drinker, and he harnessed the sulky up and went out to Angledale 
to the two old hotels and had three weeks drinking. And old Tom told me when he, Tom Leonard, when he's coming back, he met him and he said, I lost the big stones. He said, where did you lose them? Well, he said, I, it was July and he said, when I had them in my overcoat pocket, they were there and when I come to, there was no sign of them. But anyhow, they used to wonder what come over them. All the old men here, there was never a word of them. They were so big and so good they said they couldn't have got onto the world's market. Well, one day I was in Gunnedah, and I bought an ample book at a garage. It had all the things of note that happened in Australia in it. And there was one mention about opal. It said the world's most famous opal stone was dug at Lightning Ridge in 1915 by Jack Dunstan. It was sold for 90 pounds, and it brought the Rockefeller Museum paid a million and a quarter pound for it and it's now in the Rockefeller Museum in New York and that's where and I showed them the book and they said well we never knew and we never knew what happened well he must have sold it when he was drunk or something perhaps to someone for 90 pounds the two stones like it uh, they, they just whoever sold them don't know really. I remember a certain man by the name of Bert Smith and he's sitting in front of the camera here once and many years ago and he was out in an area very close <laughs> to the B&A claim and I tell you what, the stone must have been nearly as big as that he, that he, <laughs> and he put the picture. Tell us the story. Oh, us yes. The story. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Hit it with a pick in now the floor. Start the beginning. Lenny. Start the yes, beginning. sunk a monkey under a lot of colour on the roof, on the steel band, red colour. Sunk down in the chassis and the pick was a bit blunt and drove and I heard it crunch and I thought, oh, I'll have a look in a second, but it slipped in the same hole and it shattered this beautiful big black stone. It was about 80 carats of perfect black gemstone to pieces. All we got was crumbs of, like grains of wheat and that out of it. Yes, but uh, Break your heart, that's didn't true, Lenny. Did, yeah. Didn't you follow down two slides that come together as a V. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I think and it was right on the point of the V. Right yeah. on the point of the V. Yeah, it That'd was. That'd be 20 odd years ago. Oh, more, mate. That's that's 30 odd. 30 odd. Oh, yes, Lenny. Yeah, I thought that happened just after I come here. But no, come we here. got some more opal after that. We put a drive under the floor, then it was all fallen. And we got some good stones. The one with Bert Cooper and Tom Sadler and and uh, I broke one with a gate hinge trying to knock the end off it, you know. <laughs> yeah, tell us that story on the back of the year, yeah, it was, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like a cricket ball. <laughs> and I went to chip the end of it with a, one of them old L gate hinges and it shattered it everywhere. It cut 16 stones. <laughs> it would have been a mighty big stone only for that. But it wasn't out in our gem colour, that one. but. That other was a beautiful black stone that old Bert Cooper had. You know. I remember once, Bert, yeah. it'll be uh, 24 years ago, you come in and work with myself, my brother Ted, uh, Teddy Boucher, and there was one or two other of us out on the deep four mile. Yeah. Where they got yeah. them big stones. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah. this is where you really hoed into it. You said to me, boy, now you don't stop until you see the blood run out of the face That's of the, right. the yeah. drive. <laughs> we left the stones we in the out, We were flat out moving your dirt. We yeah. didn't have much time to uh, do. Old Steve Arisak got three or four thousand pounds in the side of that drive. Did he? Well, we didn't get a sack. That's right. That's our, right. Our name wasn't on it, mate. That's the way it is, yeah. No, they, they were good days, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, that's right. They yeah. were good days. Yeah. Well, let's move along now to some of the opal buyers who, who was here. From We'll start from when you first come here and we'll yeah. run right up them, right? Yeah, well, there was George Cowan and yeah, Jack we, Francis. We just don't even want names. We want to talk a little bit about them, how they dealt, the way they dealt. Yeah. Oh, well, they dealt. The uh, opal was very cheap then to what it is now and you could only get what you could get here for it, you know. And uh, uh, there was also a buyer come here, he bought some, all, and there was... But what were they like when you offered the opal to them? 
What oh. do they say? This is what I want to know. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> That's the important thing. Oh, well, what was, they what was all... Jack Francis like they with? used to say, I'll give you half. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds yeah. like Brady to me. Yeah, that's right, yeah. That was Brady that, that was used Brady. to say what that. What was Jack Francis yeah. like when you went up Oh, to he stuff? was all right, old Jack, but... Of course, you couldn't get the money like you get now, Lenny. That's true. No, nothing compared. What about Madeline? Madeline oh, Lee. yes, she was a bit hard, hey. yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you ever sell her any stones? Yes, yeah, sold her a beautiful black stone we noodled out of the dirt out of the Benchman's, mate, Gabo and I. Oh, it was a lovely stone, a 19 carat black, red, perfect, most perfect stone you ever seen. I think we got 670 pounds, it was murdered. Yeah. You'd get 50,000 for it today. You'd do better day. than that. I'll bet you would. Oh, and, I and never seen a more perfect stone. And you know, because mm. I photograph all the good stones in this yeah, field, I know yeah. what the people get. That's that right. would be chicken feed. That's right, yeah. I know of yeah. stones that's been yeah. offered up to a half a million dollars. I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't you wouldn't. You wouldn't think it possible, No, would you? I don't. But, but I, I, see many, I see many stones that range between yeah. 50 and 100,000. Go on, uh. And uh, they don't come up for the stones that we're talking about most No, of I don't doubt. Oh, gee, that was a perfect stone then. We pulled this old dirt out and we didn't have a puddler even. We used to just flee it and we found it like. Yeah. Oh, it was a lovely stone. Of course, Gabo was short of money and I didn't have much either. So we had to sell it. And there wasn't many buyers and Madeline bought it. Oh, she'd do well out of it. She was a tough lady. Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's still going, I think. Yeah. Down about your minor or somewhere. Is she? I think so. Uh, Down about yeah. why were She you? worked that old man Peter of hers, didn't oh, she? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she worked him. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> no, no two ways about that. She wore the pants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, facts are facts, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. Facts are facts. Uh, the, anyway, there was old Harold. How do you get on with Harold when you oh, were a Oh, good, stone? good, good. He was a good old fella, yeah. I thought Harold Hodges was the better of the three opal buyers at that time. Larry mm. Reynolds, Madeline, mm. and Harold. I thought yeah. Harold was the gentleman. And then the Yankee bloke. Who, oh, what was he? Collins. Yeah. Yes, he was all right, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, for a Collins. while. Yeah, yeah that's right. right, yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah. they were the ones that was here yeah. in, the, in the very early 60s. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I don't even remember a, uh, a dealer in those first early years coming to Lightning Ridge. How are you? I can't recall an opal buyer coming to Lightning Ridge in those first early years of my yeah. time here at Lightning Ridge. It no. wasn't, it wasn't oh, until no. into the 60s. They didn't come here very rarely then. It was a red letter day if you'd seen a new buyer come here. Well, we Keith Hall come for a while from Rose Bay. He yeah. bought a bit here. He Brown bought. brought a little bit. Yeah, Frank Brown too, yeah. And there was another chap, uh, mm. he was over the ground quite a bit. Teddy, someone, what was his yeah. name? Eddie's, I can't recall the name properly. But anyway, it's immaterial. He never yeah. come to Lightning Ridge very much. No. But I recall the Canadians started buying then in July 1963, uh, and so did I start buying in yeah, July 1963. Yeah, that's right. Um, Les mm. Taylor came here about the same time. That's Remember? right, yes. Ma maybe did. a year or two earlier. Yeah, somewhere about that. Probably yeah. Les, uh, he was a yeah. gentleman buyer. Yeah, he was, yeah. And that was the beginning. Yeah. Les Taylor of the Canadians and myself when yeah. Graham was the beginning of the increase of the price of opal rising that's in Lightning right. from about, that day on. Yeah, that's about right, yeah. Johnny Molyneux brought a lot of opal. He did, yeah. How'd you right. go selling to John? Oh, sold him some, Lenny, yeah. And oh, the, yeah. what about your old mate, Teddy Boucher? Oh, yes. Uh, I never sold Teddy any. You never? I don't think so. I can't remember selling him any. Mm-hmm. No. No. Well, uh, you, you must have fronted up to David Kaplan now and again. Oh, yes, a time <laughs> or two, then, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Kaplan, Arthur Blackwell started buying then. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, of course, there was yeah. Giles, etc. Yeah. What other right. buyers 
were they in, in this particular period that we're talking about now? That oh, there was a bloke come here right while the war was on. He made and patented those diamond disc saws that started to slice the opal. There was no way of cutting it till then, like slicing it. Can you remember a, his name? A bomber. Bomber. He was a Czechoslovakian. And he, he, invented, had, he invented this type of diamond Yeah, saw. he did. Yeah, mate. Artie Bruce got a couple, they were first made on brass, impregnated the diamond dust into the brass, yeah. and George the Russian worked for him in a factory in Sydney for 12 months or 18 months. And he, he sort of, they potted him, some of the blokes work, and he wouldn't tell them the secret of how him to impregnate the diamond dust into the steel. He was making a lot of aircraft tools, high precision tools for aircraft at the end of the war. And he had a factory, he had sort of men getting diamonds illegally in South Africa, send them up through Sweden, United States, out to here. And he was making the tools and selling them over the world. And he made these first wheels, diamond saws we call them now. and. Uh, he bought a bit of opal here, quite a bit, in the end of the war. And, and anyhow, he was caught a diamond at Darwin with these uh, cutting wheels, like ca carborundum cutting wheels, full of diamonds set inside them, you know. Oh, well, that's very interesting to know the person yeah. that actually started that. Yeah. Well, Bert, uh, we've just about run down You've told us a tremendous amount of information. Oh, You'll be surprised just bit how much. Boring, you know. Lenny. Yeah, it's been <laughs> tremendous actually, and I oh. suppose after we wind it all up, you'll you'll think of a hundred things that we Oh, could've... I could go on like this for weeks, mate. Yeah. I could, but I mean, uh, it, it becomes boring to most people, you know. It's not a matter of being boring to most people. It's a matter of what we're trying to do is record history for future yeah, generations. Yeah, well, When I'm gone, good. when you're gone, yeah, and even when right. our children's gone. Yes, I know. They're going to see these tapes. Yeah. And they're not going to just read something out of a book. No, they're going to see the people that's who right. experienced it. Yeah, and that's, that's what right. it's all about. It's worth the effort. Yeah. Under those oh, yes, yes. It's worth the effort, Bert. That's right, yeah. And so what about your old mate, Bert Tester? Oh yes, yes. We we'll wind up with telling us about him. We got a good stone, him and I. We, he, we were pulling a bit of dirt out of the B and A, and he pulled up a bucket, and there was this nice stone. Lenny cut it, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, a very nice stone, Lenny. Yes. Oh yeah. Well, on behalf of the Historical Society, Bert, I want to thank you very, very oh, much for your time you're and your welcome. effort. And You're uh, welcome, mate, for all it's worth, yes. It's been worth a tremendous amount, and maybe mm. at a later date we uh, oh, we'll get together yes. again. Yeah, okay. well, if it's any use to you, Thank Lenny. you very much. Yes, it's no trouble. Wait till I unhook your power, mate, so you don't get a short in you, hit you. It's 240 volt stuff. Wait till I, uh, where'll I put you?